peninsula that points towards Siberia. Well, Father Ivanali, we now went to the Cook Inlet area after that, and then we reportedly disappeared. In the diary of Father Ivanali, that's exactly where he's found, at Lake Iliamda, halfway across Alaska, where, according to the diary, and therefore the history books, he came into a village where there was some mm, trouble between the Russian fur traders and the local natives. Uh, he, nevertheless, uh, began converting people, and the chief, actually there's an incident in, in uh, American cinematographic history like this. If any of you have seen the old Robert Redford movie, Jeremiah Johnson, there's a scene there where uh, the chief offers Robert Redford, Jeremiah Johnson, his daughter. And Jeremiah is not particularly interested in getting married now or ever, I think. And he says, I can't go through with this, I'm just not going to take And his buddy says, well, if you don't, if you don't take her, they're going to kill us. <laughs> so Jeremiah winds up with a wife that he's not particularly interested in having, and he treats her kind of badly for a good portion of the movie, and then eventually they, they develop some romantic feelings for each other, they have a child, and so forth. Anyway, it's that kind of situation. According to the diary, the chief offers this monk his daughter. Of course, he refuses. <coughs> then, according to the diary, supposedly written by Father Ivanali himself, uh, he wakes up that night, and this woman is in bed with him. <laughs> and, well, one thing leads to another, so it's like the seduction of Father Ivanali. And the next morning, he gets up to sort of confess all this, and he's writing all of this down. But he's rejected the girl. He's kind of thrown her out. And the, so the family comes with their tomahawks and their hatchets and whatever else, and they kill him. So this is the story that has circulated for over 100 years. Yuvenali got that far to Lake Iliamna. He met this chief. The chief offered him his daughter. The daughter seduced him. And then he's writing this dear diary confession. And in the middle of the, middle of the sentence, He's killed, and that diary then some, somehow makes its way into Petrov's hands. Petrov takes the diary to San Francisco, and it becomes established historical fact. Great Victorian melodrama for late 19th century Americans, and that's what everybody believed, including yours truly, when we first read the histories of Alaska. It's just one of those chapters. One of the monks might have been a saint, but the other one didn't quite qualify. That's how it comes out. And so it was until, for 20 years, so I, I simply believe that. But I was also given, uh, move ahead, we don't want to give away the story yet. <laughs> or, yeah. Keep going. Now the trick to this and watching it and hearing Father Michael is that we time this exactly to his talk. His talk is different every time he gives it. <laughs> right. So here we have Native Alaskans being evangelized by St. Herman and St. Juvenali. Just move ahead. Okay. And this is the land they walked over. We've already covered that, too. And this is Alaska. And what, what I'm saying is, here's Kodiak Island. Yuvenali was given this territory. Father Makari was given this territory. And they argued about who was going here. Right? And so since Yuvenali was coming this way, he said, when I'm done with my territory, I can get there. And you, and you Father Makari, when you're done with your territory, you're going to be halfway to Japan. So we know Yuvenali won the argument. And really on the lake, it's not very clear here. We can go to the next Shall I copy to do without him? <laughs> this is Balam. This is just introduction to, in, in case you didn't know anything about the Balam mission and the Balam monks and coming to Co coming to Alaska and so forth. And here they're landing at Kodiak. Keep going. Ah, here, this is good. So, Yuvenali's territory was in the Aleutic area here. And, he, and, and according to the diary, he had a terrible time learning. In fact, he had no success learning Aleutic. Then he evangelized these people and crossed through the Denina area and wound up here where he was killed, but where he learned Yupik in a matter of weeks. Now, anyone who knows these two languages, this is color-coded. You can barely tell the difference in color between Yupik and Sukbyak, Alutik, and that's about the difference. It's like Italian. And you can tell that not only is it, is it the same language family, but about 80% of the vocabulary is the same. So it was one of the first things that made me suspicious about the diary. How could he not, how, how could he have so much trouble learning this language and then in a very short time learn this one when they're like almost the same, practically the same language? Well, in any case, um, I wasn't at all suspicious about the diary until 
I was the priest in this area. And I, I came through the Iliamna Lake area and asked people, rather undiplomatically from the Denina group, okay, uh, confess here. You, you must have some story about how and where you killed the first priest who came to you. <laughs> One needless to say, people aren't particularly interested in confessing, and, but, but they weren't at all. They said, well, actually, we know that's what's in the history books, but we have no tradition whatsoever of any priest coming through here and being killed. We have a priest coming through here and heading that way. Further west, but we don't have any tradition. And I thought, well, they're just covering up. Who would? And then I said, well, okay, to somebody else. Um, do you know where they killed him? And they said, yeah, we call that rock out there in the middle of the lake, Monk Rock. And this rock was like a hound's tooth, completely smooth sides and no beach on it whatsoever. There's no place to stand on this rock. So I turned to this informant and said, no, it's okay. It's the rock, we have the rock. Oh, you have the rock. Yeah, yeah I was going to go here yeah. so this and get the good. order. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. There's Bancroft. You have Next. the rock. Yeah, we do. We do. The Bancroft Just Library, the monks. Keep going. The power are not, they're not, yeah. not relevant. And these are the ships that brought the original colonists, but it's mm -hmm. not Port Forest over here. This is Iliana Lake. Okay, that's this. Oh wait, go back one. This is this is the reprint, the Sin of Father Ivanal. It's one of, in one of the later history books. Mm -hmm. <coughs> okay. Okay. This stuff here. Mm -hmm. Never mind the rock. Okay. Uh, the rock, there's no place to stand on the rock. So I turned to the, this supposed informant and said, you're pulling my leg, aren't you? And they said, yeah. But when people insist that we're the ones who killed the monk, we always point to that rock. And if they're dumb enough to believe that that's where we took him to kill him, we let them believe that. <laughs> <laughs> but it's clearly not possible, right? Well, and in that case, this is my, my wife's stepfather, Adam Andrew. Um, some years later, he came to me at our house and said, I want to tell you about the first priest to come into the Yupik area. Now, I know the first priest that came into the Yupik area. It's St. Yaakov Netzvetov. He spent 18 years on the Yukon River. He learned Yupik. And as you all know now, he died and is buried in Sitka. That was the story Adam told me. Oh, the first priest, okay, without even discussing, I didn't even, it didn't even click that this was Juvenali with me at first. The first priest came into our area uh, along the Bering Sea coast, Anyajogami, literally in a little boat. It's significant that it's not Kayagami in a kayak. It's Anyajogami in a little boat. I had two. Keep going. No, just, let, just let it go. No, just leave the story. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, he was in, he encountered in his little boat um, along this coast. But go back to Adam. Along this coast, he encountered. Uh, a hunting party, among which there was a shaman. And the shaman was alarmed at the approaches of this stranger and uh, told the other hunters, uh, chase him away. Discourage him from coming any closer. And not, he doesn't describe what gestures they would have made, waving their arms, shaking their fists, maybe even raising their weapons, but it didn't work. Whatever, whatever they did, the little boat continued to approach. So then the shaman, according to Adam's story, gave the order, kill him. And the, the priest was killed in a hail of arrows, and his body fell into the boat. However, he wasn't alone. He had picked up a guide, uh, an assistant. Actually, in, in Yupit, they call him his, his nakista, his reader. But it's somebody accompanying the priest and helping him. And this reader, once the priest was killed, jumped overboard and tried to swim across the, the river. Now the river there is the mouth of the Kuskokwim River. It's probably eight to 10 miles wide. It's a, it's a very wide expense to get to the other side. But this guy could swim remarkably well. So well, in fact, that he was diving and coming up for air and diving and coming up for air. In the Yupik version, he was swimming like a seal. The hunters who had killed the priest then had to get into their, their kayaks and chase him down. But they, unfortunately, they were able to catch this man. It was just too far to get to the other side of the river. They caught up with him and they killed him. And of course, his body went to the bottom of the, of the bay. Then they went back to the, the open boat and they pulled the boat ashore and they removed from the body of the priest his brass pectoral cross. And the shaman, according to Adam's story, uh, removed the cross and put it on 
and tried to do some kind of seance or magic, some kind of ceremony, but it didn't work. He tried three times, and each time he felt himself levitated. And this, this alarmed him so that he removed the cross and tossed it aside and said to the people there, the other hunters, I don't know what this thing is, but there's some power here I cannot deal with. And the next time someone comes, we better pay attention. And that was Adam's story. Now, at this point, I dismissed it completely. I knew the first priest that came to the Yupik region was not killed at this village on the Bering Sea coast. I knew it was St. Yaakov Nesvetov. I, I knew he died in Sitka. This was just some kind of garbled old wives' tale. I, I dismissed it. But then, in, my, in the course of my research doing other things, I consistently came across the next three, four, five priests mentioning exactly the same village that Adam had mentioned in his story and saying specifically this is where Father Juvenali was killed. Now I was still believing the diary that he was killed back at Lake Iliana. But the documentary evidence was mounting that in fact, like the people there say, he didn't die at Lake Iliana. <laughs> he went further west. Okay, we can move the slides. So there's Father Yaakov, at least one icon, one icon of him. And so he, he went pet. Now he's swimming like a seal. Right, come in the open boat. <laughs> there's the open boat. Of course, he wasn't alone. Keep going. There's the seal. OK, keep going. And here's, here's the iconographic uh, representation of the martyrdom of St. Giovanni. You see uh, the archers on the beach, the uh, assistant. Uh, it looks more like falling than diving overboard. Uh, the seals to indicate swimming like a seal on his part and so forth. So uh, this is, this is a, and the shaman there with his mask uh, holding a spear but actually giving the order, uh, kill him. Grass, frost, pest, petrol, cross. Now, he was newly ordained. So that's probably the kind of cross a newly ordained priest would have had. Not necessarily this one, but one like it. So there's the rock. There's a rock. Uh, the rock. You see, the, it's, this isn't exactly the rock in the middle of Lake Eliota, but it's like this. If you want to believe that they bothered to take the priest out to the middle of the lake rather than kill him right where he was, it doesn't really make any sense to believe that you would have bothered to go to all that trouble. And so it's clearly not true. Well, Sometimes I mean, we'll, 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 we'll wait for Pennsylvania now. So, I find references every time a priest goes through Guinahawk, the name of this village, every priest, including St. Yaakov, and his next three or four successors, every time in their journals, their travel journals, they mention this village, Guinahawk, they all reiterate that's where Father Ivanali was killed. That corroborates the story I heard from my father in law. Okay, so that's coming together. But who's to say what we ever really know? Well, it turns out a friend of mine at the university was doing research in the, in the history of the Moravian missions in, in Alaska. And the, the Moravian seminary in the United States is in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. Well, I was raised in Emmaus, Pennsylvania. Uh, Father Thomas now lives in Northampton near Nazareth, Pennsylvania. I have a grandson living in Egypt, Pennsylvania. These are all towns founded by Moravian brethren, uh, immigrants from what is now the Czech Republic, German-speaking Protestants who settled in Pennsylvania. But in, in the time of Sheldon Jackson, they were given um, the southern the Yupik region, at least part of it, as their mission territory. Uh, and those of you who are reading Conflicting Visions in Alaskan Education know that in the 18, late 1860s, the federal government, uh, their, their, rather their commissioner of education, Sheldon Jackson, sat down with about a dozen Protestant denominations and they carved Alaska up into spheres of influence. The Moravian Brethren got the Lower Kuskokwim. The Baptists got Kodiak Island. The Presbyterians got this part of Alaska and the North Slope since no one else would take it. Um, the Methodists got the Aleutian Islands. The Lutherans got the uh, 
Seward Peninsula, and so forth. The Quakers got Kotzebue. Anything I mentioned that one of the part of Alaska as their official mission territory, it was awarded by the federal government, and then they were assigned to run the schools in that territory, in that region. And the part of their salary was paid by their church as missionaries, and part of their salary was paid by the federal government because they were federal schools. So it was a collusion of the federal government and Protestant denominations, and as Sheldon Jackson would say, to eradicate the Orthodox Church in Alaska. Their goal, at least one of their primary goals, was to eliminate the Orthodox Church because we were supporting the native cultures and languages, and the American government was absolutely opposed to anything but English and only English. Now, that, by the way, that as a footnote, that policy came because after the Civil War, with so many, almost a million men killed, and several more million uh, incapacitated, permanently injured, uh, we had a labor shortage in the United States. And that the solution to that was sort of a stroke of genius, the Statue of Liberty. Give me your tired, your poor, and 18 million tired and poor, including my ancestors and many of yours, showed up. <laughs> but the country only had 34 million people at that time. And when 18 more million people showed up, that's 50% again. And the people who came were not Mayflower pilgrims. As you understand, right? Uh, Mayflower pilgrims were white. Those Arabs and those Middle Eastern folk didn't look all that white. White Anglo. They, meaning speaking English, almost none of the immigrants after the, after the Civil War spoke English, white Anglo-Saxon. Saxony is in Germany. These people did nothing on time. <laughs> <laughs> and white Anglo-Saxon Protestant, that's the ethnic group that, that came to Plymouth Rock and Jamestown and all the rest, and almost none of them after the Civil War were Protestant. So the country was suddenly flooded with a, 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 half as many again people who were not racially and culturally like the people had been there until now. So the, I would say the United States as a country had a migraine headache for about 30 years. <laughs> they just didn't know what to do with these foreigners. Now in the past, being very tribal in the early centuries, when uh, the pilgrims met somebody who was not of the same tribe, they did the same thing that tribal peoples did everywhere else in the world. They killed them. I mean, we, it's something that our country has never quite come to honest uh, grips with, but the only good Indian is... Yeah. And there's, uh, there's three centuries of history behind that, that proverb. Right? There was, we had our own Holocaust on this side of the Atlantic. But it, I was just saying, the pilgrims simply behaved the way tribal peoples always do. You meet another group that is not like you, and since you're the human beings, by definition, they're not. And there's two things you can do with that population. You can kill them, we covered that before, or you can enslave them. And that's exactly what we did as a country from the 16th, 17th into the 1800s. We killed the Indians and enslaved the Africans. Now I'm saying we, my ancestors, could, I could claim exemption. Mine was still in Europe. <laughs> <laughs> and probably most of yours were too. Yeah. We, we're not personally guilty of any, of any of that. But if you're an American, you have to face that that's the story of our country. And the story of our country is tribal at the beginning. And if people were different, they got killed or they got enslaved. And that's the beginning of everybody's history, practically. It's not just the United States. Now, Thomas Jefferson, when he purchased the Louisiana Territory, he actually had a series of cabinet meetings about this. Because suddenly the country was twice as big. The Indians were no longer a threat to the survival of the American Republic. But, so the question then arose, are we going to keep on killing them until we get to the Pacific Ocean? <laughs> or can we do something more humane? And the solution was reservations. We'll just get them out of the way. They're racially and culturally different from us. But we don't necessarily have to wipe them out. We don't have to kill them. We don't have to exterminate them. We'll just get them out of the way. And that way they can live, you know, as long as the grass is green and the water flows and sun shines. So the northern tribes were moved to the Dakotas. And the southern tribes were moved to what is now Oklahoma. And they were promised that they could keep that land forever and ever. Until, of course, we found oil in one and gold in the other. <laughs> and then all bets were off. But that comes later. <laughs> but that's the history of our country. Now, what I'm saying is, when, um, after the Civil War, they started rethinking even those policies. Because we were running out of space for reservations. And Alaska had just been purchased. 
So Sheldon Jackson, I would say to his credit, says, two things we're not going to have in Alaska. We're not going to have Indian wars. We're not going to exterminate these Alaska Native peoples. We put that, we've closed that chapter permanently. And we're also not going to have reservations. We're not going to move these people off their land and shove them into some godforsaken corner of the planet. We're not going to have Indian wars. We're not going to have reservations. What are we going to have? We're going to have the same policy that we have for the immigrants. The immigrants were also racially and culturally different. Editorials in the New York Times, the Ch Chicago Tribune, uh, of the Boston Globe called our ancestors the barbarians. They were not like us, and since us means the real people. <laughs> and you see, it's the same, the same way of thinking. Um, what are we going to do with these barbarians who not, are not like the barbarians before? The barbarians before were on the frontier. These are, these are in the middle of our own cities. And here's the zinger, and they're breeding. <laughs> the immigrants were having big families. So someone did the math and said, if we're not careful, in 50 years, these barbarians are going to take over and we're going to lose control here. So you see, that's why I said the country had a migraine for 30 years. They didn't know, what have we done? They brought all these immigrants in to do the work because the, work, the labor force was depleted by the Civil War. And now we had that railroad to build, you know? We had those steel mills, those coal mines. All that hard, gr grungy labor had to be done. The locals didn't want to do that, same as today. <laughs> you bring in somebody else to do that work, right? So, but the other, the somebody else's were, were half as many as you are, and they're having these big families. So the country actually came up with a, I would call it a stroke of genius. If setting up the Statue of Liberty and inviting the immigrants over was stroke of genius number one, stroke of genius number two were the public schools. The public schools in America didn't exist before the Civil War. Remember Abraham Lincoln had to find somebody to teach him how to read. You, had, you only had a school in, uh, thank you. We, you only had a school if um, you had a Mrs. Olson, like in uh, Walnut Grove. You need someone to get everybody organized, build the school out of your own pockets with your own labor, buy the textbooks, buy, hire the teacher, and then you had a school. But that was rare. But public schools became the norm after the Civil War, actually more in the 1880s and 90s, because we had to do something with these barbarians. We can't kill them. We just invited them in. We can't enslave them. Son of a gun, we just abolished slavery. <laughs> We're not going to kick them out, put them on reservations. So what are we going to do with these people who are not like us if we're not going to kill them, enslave them, or expel them? We're going to assimilate them. The, the, the notion is that we will teach them to be us. They will learn our language, they will go to our churches, and they will accept our story as their story. And they will forget the story that they left behind on the other side of the Atlantic, and they will pretend that they too were at Plymouth Rock and Gettysburg. <laughs> Right. And they charged up San Juan Hill with Teddy Roosevelt. We're going to teach them. And they will identify with our story, and they will speak our language. And in another generation, they will be indistinguishable from the white Anglo-Saxon Protestants who've been here all along. Now, how are you going to do that? We can't do that with Mama and Papa. They have to go to work in the sweatshops and the steel mills and the mines. But you pass compulsory school attendance laws. And this has to be reconsidered. Child labor laws. For the first time in history, kids may not work. This could, this could be a fatal flaw in our Constitution now. <laughs> because, but in any case, kids may not work because they have to go to school. And the reason the government suddenly got so vitally concerned with public schools, which we never had before, is that they were determined to assimilate the children of the immigrants and make real Americans out of them. Now, that's all going on in the United States when Sheldon Jackson becomes Commissioner of Education for Alaska. He brings that mindset, that new policy with him. He writes to the new teachers that he's hiring who are missionary teachers. We have no greater uh, goal in life than to be missionaries of the Anglo-Saxon frame of mind, whatever that is. Bring Shakespeare and Walter Scott and all the great works of, of British literature to arouse the sluggish minds of the natives to the ideals of our civilization. This is assimilation. We're going to teach these barbarians to be like us. And if they can speak English and put on a coat and tie and become good Presbyterians, 
in another generation, we'll all, it's the melting pot. We're all gonna melt into the pot, but the pot is a white Anglo-Saxon Protestant pot. <laughs> it's not everybody contributing their own little bit. The, the agenda is for everyone to become the same. We're gonna have the same beam of light, we're gonna have the same story, we're gonna play the same ball game by the same rules. And kids will learn that in the public schools. And by the way, for the immigrants, it worked tremendously well because most of us are the product of precisely that policy. Uh, but now Sheldon Jackson brings it to Alaska. There's big difference between Alaska Native people and indigenous people across the North American continent and the immigrants. And the, these are the two principal ones. The immigrants, for whatever reason, chose to come here. They made a choice. And they knew that they would have to adjust accordingly. And secondly, their language and culture will survive in the homeland they left behind. For indigenous people, neither of those apply. For indigenous people, they didn't decide to go someplace to become something they weren't. This policy was imposed on them with no negotiation. And probably more significantly, if they adjust, if they assimilate, their language and culture dies. It disappears. So while my family welcomed assimilation, the public school, what a blessing. You're going to teach my kids to read and write and fit in and be successful in this society. God bless you. Thank you very much. And it's free. <laughs> in the old country, people paid tuition and still did, right? So, but for the Native Americans, it was very different. Now, the Moravian mission is, are the people who are given the Cuscoquim Delta, where all this is happening 100 years before. Mr. Jackson off the screen. <laughs> so, <coughs> we're getting too far ahead. Um, what do you want? Not that. That was that was it. There's the open boat. This is a bigger one, but you see, um, the Bering Sea coast is rocky like this, but then there there are these flat areas now. Um, this colleague of mine who went to the Moravian archives to research the history of the Moravian Brethren's mission in Alaska. She comes across this notation from John Kilbuck, who was the first school teacher at Guinahawk, and he was also, of course, not just a public school teacher, he was also the Moravian Brethren missionary. And he writes to his headquarters from the, from the mouth of the Cuscoquim, apparently I'm not the first Christian missionary to come here. <coughs> I'm told by local people that uh, many years ago, an Orthodox priest came along the beach in a little boat. And he met a hunting party, uh, among whom was a shaman. And the shaman gave the order to chase him away, but he kept coming. And so the archers killed him in a hail of air arrows. And his helper, his guide, jumped overboard and swam like a seal. Now, Kilpuck was writing this in the 1890s. The incident happened in the 1790s. I heard the story from Adam Andrew in the 1990s. It's verbatim the same story. Are things looking a little suspicious here, right? We begin to say with some certainty, Father Juvenali made it out to the Bering Sea coast, which is where he said he was going anyway. That fits, huh? Uh, and he was killed in a hail of arrows of the... Okay, so I write all this up. I write this up with little essays published in St. Vladimir Seminary Quarterly 25 years ago, and I gave it to one of my students from Greenhawk without telling her what this was about. He said, please read this and get back to me what you think. Weeks went by, I didn't hear a thing. Finally, I got up my courage and I said to the lady, Pauline, did you have a chance to read that essay that I wrote? She says, yeah. I said, well, what did you think? She said, well, they didn't know he was a priest. <laughs> <laughs> and I figured that's as close as I'll ever get to getting a confession out of anybody who has heard that story within that village. But now, why, why would they do this? I mean, he was unarmed. They had a, an armed band of hunt, 
of hunters on the beach. Clearly they had bows and arrows, they had spears and, and harpoons and all the rest. He is one certainly strange looking guy, more facial hair than they had probably ever seen, right? Just looking out, uh, wearing a uniform they had also not seen, but is that reason to kill the guy? Why couldn't they just take him prisoner? They outnumbered him. What was the motive? If all of this is true, what was the motive for killing the priest in the boat? Now, in the Smithsonian Institute, we found this. And we have several drawers of these. And these are chains made of ivory out of walrus tusk. Now, it takes quite a bit to even imagine carving out of one solid piece all these separate links. Where did they get that idea? And the, and the caption was, shamans in Alaska wore ivory chains as a sign of their status as medicine men, as shamans, in imitation of the metal chains that shamans on the Siberian side wore. So, this guy shows up wearing a metal chain. You see? Now you get the idea He's a shaman from the other side. You don't know what kind of powers or magic he might have. To protect yourself from those powers, the safest thing to do is keep him far enough away that he cannot project his power on you, which is exactly what they tried to do. But when he gets too close in self-defense, you really have no choice, really. As I can see that if you can put yourself into the Yupik men's point of view, vision, uh, beam of light, as they're standing on the... So this, this is another important, important clue into what happened with Father Ivanali. And in the icon, you will see, if you look closely, the shaman is wearing, we deliberately depicted in the icon of the, of the scene, wearing a, an ivory chain. So this is another step, right? Can we go, go further? Oh, back, back, to, back to Maximus. Maximus is another. Now, Yuvenali left Kodiak alone. He shows up in Quinahawk, at least with this guy who could swim like a seal. Right? By the way, you pick people almost never try to get wet. They have this idea about hypothermia. Once you get wet, you die. <laughs> and so you avoid getting wet. You don't get your clothes wet. And there is, in, as far as I know, in the entire, entire Yupik region, no tradition of swimming whatsoever, which is why they were so impressed with this swimmer. But who's he? They're, I'm in the village of Tayonic on the, on the Danaina, the, the Indian side of that boundary, sitting at breakfast with the starosta Maxim, which is why his patron saint is here. And I said to this elder, Maxim, you know, all the, all the stories point to the fact that Father Ivanali came through here but kept right on going. But somewhere along the way, he picked up a guide. Now, this is doubly necessary because there have hardly been any white people go through there. There were no maps. He wants to go west, but how do you get there? Where are the valleys? Where are the passes? Where are the rivers? He doesn't know. It's not mapped. But the Athabascan people have been there for 15,000 years. They know. So it seems logical he would have picked up someone to show him the way. And whoever it was in this case was a swimmer. So I asked the starosta Maxim, uh, is there any swimming tradition in your village? Now this is along the shores of Koch Inlet, right on the Pacific Ocean. An area we know visited by St. Juvenali. And the, the elder said to me, swimming, of course. We, we hunt beluga whales here in our territory. When you harpoon the whale and it dives, we, t we teach our boys to go in after it. And then he's in his 80s, he says, I've been swimming all my life. And I still go swimming once in a while. So this might seem to remind me where we go. Okay, now we can say with some um, confidence he picked up an Athabascan guide to show him the way. I'm not sure why this is here. Because well, <laughs> the paintings, the, the churches uh, in the area. So, so the guide um, is an Athabascan and he's dressed in Athabascan attire. The, the further evidence is if he had been Yupik, Highly unlikely because he was such a good swimmer. But if he had been Yupik, he could have called out to those archers on the shore in their own language. Cousins, don't shoot. I'm one of your relatives. I'm from such and such a village. He couldn't do that because he didn't speak their language because he wasn't Yupik.
So you put all this together, and now we have one final uh, gesture in the icon that I want to share with you. Where's the, I, ch where's the chain? Uh, on the shaman. Is our shaman wearing one? Uh, yes. Oh, he hasn't. Well, he should be on the, this is the, this guy's holding a, a mask to show he's the shaman, but. Uh, we forgot. <laughs> <laughs> uh, on the other icon, he's wearing underneath this post. On the other icon, he's wearing an ivory chain. But in any case, um, you can only stand in the boat. I have a nephew from further up the river, 80 miles, who married a woman from this village. So I told him, keep your ears open just in case someone in the village tells this story about, well, the whole episode. And after a few years, he came to me and said, I heard several elders retelling this story, and it's just the way Appa, Adam Andrew, told it, except for one thing. According to the local tradition as I heard it, just before the priest died, just before they released the arrows, which would have to be within sight, of course, that in archery, you've got to, you've got to be able to... Tick, tick. <laughs> you've got to be able to make, you have sight of your, your target. Just before he died, it looked to the people on the shore, and this is reported to this day, it looked to the people on the shore like he was trying to chase away flies. Orthodox, exactly. Orthodox people get it right away. Everybody else is looking at me like, huh? Orthodox people understand. You know what he was doing. He was blessing He was blessing those who were about to kill him. Probably quickly. <laughs> he only had a seconds left, right? And 200 years later, this is still remembered in that village as chasing away flies because they still haven't figured that he was blessing or praying, either way, whether his hand was facing this way or this way, right? So I think we can say with some confidence, it's Alaska's longest standing murder mystery. <laughs> what happened to Father Juvenali? And little by little, I wasn't like researching this like a detective pursuing the evidence. It just, little by little, well, that, does, that fits with this. It's like finding the pieces to a jigsaw puzzle, and you don't even know it's a jigsaw puzzle yet, mm -hmm. until you have all the pieces on the table, and you say, hey, wait a minute, this makes a consistent picture. So at this village, there are now, because of intermarriage, remember that's the key here, because of intermarriage, in this particular village, there are almost 100 Orthodox people. The village council has awarded them land on which to build a church. You know what we will have to name that church, right? It will be the St. Juvenali and his companion church. And this, this predates Peter the Aleut, by the way. So there was an Athabascan Indian martyr for the Orthodox faith, even before Peter the Alley was captured down in Sonoma County. Uh, and this is another, therefore, I mean, I mean our, our Athabascan people are very proud of this guy. We'll probably never know his name. The iconographers who painted him called him Paul to go with Peter. <laughs> he's dressed in Athabascan attire, uh, and he's the swimmer, the guy who could swim like a seal. But you see what it took to do all this? There's the, we had to overcome the Bancroftian mythology, which by the way, I mentioned this at the end, was actually quite easy to do if you were orthodox. I went to the Bancroft Library and I asked to see the, a copy of this diary of Father Juvenali. There is no Russian original, by the way. That's already suspicious, don't you think? The English translation is in Ivan Petrov's handwriting. And it's probably coincidental Juvenali, as a good Orthodox monk, dates everything, not just the secular date, but the feast date. Except he, almost none of his feast days are right. He has feast days, he has saints that are on the Orthodox calendar, but they're in the wrong month and on the wrong day. He sails on a ship, he claims, named the, Anasta the uh, Adrian and Anastasia. You don't have to look that up to figure it out that there was never such a boat, right? The boats, that, the boats that came to Alaska, we had them before, the three hierarchs, Basil the Great, Gregory the Theologian, John Chrysostom, because there's such a feast day, and the ship had that feast day, right? Then there was the Simeon and Anna, but there is such a feast day, so the ship could have that feast day. And the last one was the Archangel Michael. Well, of course, there's an Archangel Michael feast day, but there is no feast day, the Adrian and Anastasia. There's an Adrian and Natalia. But you would never name a ship. You don't even have to look in the Russian American Company archives to find out if there ever was such a ship. You know there wasn't, because there's no such feast. And it's those kind of 
errors of detail that make the diary obviously a fraud. Not to mention the fact that monks don't keep dear diary kind of records. Dear diary, I'm, I'm lonesome and depressed today. No! <laughs> when, when Simeon Yanovsky, the governor who succeeded Baranov, came to Kodiak, uh, he sat down with Father Herman and said, you guys claim that the, that the population here has been decimated by the policies of Baranov and his henchmen. That you, they round up hundreds and, he, and over the years even thousands of men and they've disappeared and never come home. Can you prove this? Do you have any records of baptisms and deaths and so forth? And Father Herman says, we were never given paper to keep such records. So why would this monk be wasting what little paper they had? You'd see, so much about the diary then suddenly becomes completely suspect and even ridiculously fraudulent. But it's still the way our history books are. You'll still find stories of Father Ibn Ali being killed by, after being seduced by the Indian woman and all the rest. It makes good press. But I think we can say we have now proven, at least from, from a scholarly point of view, the most amazing part being that the native oral tradition for two centuries has remained consistent about this. And the Orthodox Church archives support that completely. And when you put the two together, and these are the only eyewitness accounts that could be, the churches and the native, when you put them together, they don't contradict each other, but only, in fact, reinforce and corroborate each other. So that we can say with some confidence, holy martyr Juvenali, pray unto God for us. And we have, you're the birthday girl, you get to go out the presents. <laughs> We have copies of this. Oh. Did you have that done? Uh, Sasha and Kitty did. You can tell them about the iconographer. If you, who did the... Uh, uh, Matthew Garrett is the iconographer. Oh. He, has, uh, he learned uh, iconography in Pennsylvania near Antiochian Village. Oh. And he now lives in the West somewhere um, well, where he does classes. And so I we sent him the story of St. Juvenali and then he did die. I, we didn't want to write on this, uh, on this icon, you know, this is Queen of Hawk or something like that. So I asked around, I said, is there a geological feature anywhere near the village that anyone who had ever been there would know that's where this is without writing, you know, the name. And they said, of course, Ivy Mountain. Ivy uh. Mountain. And it turns out that there's a mountain behind the village. Not ivy like the Ivy League, ivy like with leaves and vines, but, but it actually has an I and a V in it. It is ivy. And if you look out and you look in our icon, on this icon, you see the mountain with the letters I and V, like the Roman numeral four, in the background. Four, one more time. Oh, yes. <laughs> and it, it's the, it's the um, identification that this is the village of Greenahawk, where all of this occurred, because it's the only village where, when you look at it at a certain angle, the mountain has these huge letters I and V, as if it were carved in it. It could be E.U. Vanali as well. Oh. I don't, I'm sh this may be, it's hard to tell, this is an, the iconographer's uh, imagination, if this, this looks almost wooden, but the boat would have been made of skin, of course or even of a birch bark if it was an Athabascan boat. And I, I checked back at that village, what kind of boats did your people use when they went out on the ocean? And they said the same kind of birch bark canoes we used when we were on the rivers. So they didn't have any bigger boats with higher sides or anything like that. This is actually what they indeed used until very recently to, uh, to hunt on the, on the North Pacific Ocean. But these are pliable, I mean, they're, they're portable. They only weigh like 20 pounds, so one person can pick up such a boat and, and hike from one street to another in the interior of Alaska. And it seems that that's probably what Father Juvenali came to Quinaha in. Now, um, there are also some reports further down the coast of people, of some people coming to the trading post, the Russian-American company trading post, somebody wearing a brass cross 20, 30 years later. So that would be the find of the century to discover who has that brass cross in their family, you know, chest, their, their family archives. But um, whether we'll ever find that, it's maybe doubtful. And of course, it's even more doubtful that we'll ever know this side of paradise who Father Juvenali's companion was. But that he existed, he's the swimmer, 
that he's almost certainly off the Baskin since those are the swimming people that Ali Ibn Ali met, and that he wasn't able to speak Yupik to dissuade these guys from killing him, all of that fits together to indicate that we can at least identify him as an Athabascan Indian who was guiding Father Ibnali, someone Father Ibnali had, had baptized, and who offered to show him the way westward through the rivers and out to the, north, out to the Bering Sea, where he, of course, also then perished uh, at, the, at the village of Puinahar. Now, maybe it's because it's the shorter story, I can relay at least the story of two more martyrs associated with Alaska, who you maybe have never heard of at all. Uh, these are 20th century martyrs. The first is one of my favorites. It's uh, Saint Basil Martish, M-A-R-T-Y, spelled Polish, S-Z. Father Basil Martish was a little boy, 10 years old, in about 1890 who came to America with his father, who had been a judge in, well, in the Russian Empire, but was today Poland. And uh, the father was a judge who had resigned his commission as judge and gone to seminary and sort of late vacations, became a priest. And he took his 10-year-old boy with him to New, to New York. And they happened to come to uh, then St. Nicholas Cathedral. It was ours in those days, remember. and. Um, and uh, the Bishop of Alaska, who was the only bishop in all of North America, Bishop Vladimir, happened to be there. So, no, it's still there, but the, the, so the Soviet government took it. <laughs> so, but it was our cathedral to start with. Anyway, um, the, the, the boy apparently sang with the choir that day, this 10-year-old boy. And the bishop came over to him after liturgy and said, young man, you have a very pleasant voice. If you ever become a priest, I have a parish for you. <laughs> well, the boy went back to Poland, he finished seminary, he married, he got ordained at the age of 20, 10 years later. He didn't forget Bishop Vladimir's invitation. He got on a boat and came to America. And the bishop did have a parish for him. A Fognac Island, Alaska. <laughs> so off they went to Alaska, the satellite villages outside of Kodiak. And there, for the next four or five years, he went from village to village. This is in the 19, 20, 19-teens, uh, early 20th century, and by kayak, the same way that they had done since the time of St. Herman. A Fognac Island, Woody Island, Spruce Island. He was the parish priest for those three villages. And then, of course, uh, he eventually became the parish priest for the, for the town of Kodiak itself and ran the school, the native Alaskan school in Kodiak. But Matushka apparently really didn't appreciate the Alaskan climate. And by that time, they had several kids, and so they, had, they petitioned to move someplace further south. This is always a mistake in my experience. I had, a for, I had a foreign exchange student at my house in Juneau who, after a year in Juneau, applied to Michigan Tech University yeah. to, to study engineering. You know where Michigan Tech is. Yeah, you Upper Peninsula. <laughs> we asked him, Paco, why are you going to the Upper Peninsula of Michigan to go to college? He said, it's further south, it'll be warmer. <laughs> <laughs> Hardly. <laughs> so so he, he lasted one semester and moved to Arizona. Arizona State is where he graduated from. <laughs> but it was the same thing here. Father Basil and his Matushka Olga decided to move further south. So they were assigned to Osceola Mills, Pennsylvania. <laughs> the coldest place in Pennsylvania. Uh, then they moved to Old Forge, which wasn't much warmer. And finally, Edmonton. <laughs> I think for about a decade they were looking for some warm place in North America without success. And then in, in, 19, in 1914, he finally, they gave up on North America and they went home just in time for the outbreak of World War I. Oh, my goodness. As the German armies moved into Western Russia, they escaped, they retreated with the Russian armies, and they wound up all the way back in Moscow, where they met Bishop Vladimir in retirement. <laughs> and he found them a place to live in the Andronic Monastery in Moscow. They survived World War I as refugees in Russia. But then, of course, out of the frying pan into the fire, the Bolsheviks took over in 1917. He's an Orthodox priest. It's not a healthy thing to be an Orthodox priest in 1917 in Moscow. 
So he, he worked as a, a teamster as, uh, on, the, on the docks just unloading ships. And then 1918, Poland became a separate country. So he applied for a Polish passport and was awarded Polish citizenship by virtue of the fact that that's where he was born. And the family got out of the Soviet Union and moved to Poland, where because of his international, I'm sure because of his intelligence, but also his international um, uh, experience. He's, he almost certainly spoke English then. Uh, he knew Russian then. Of course, he was a native speaker of Polish. He became the chancellor of the Polish Orthodox Church. And he was responsible for negotiating uh, their, agree their autocephaly agreement with Constantinople. Uh, he, he was also the main, main military chaplain for the Orthodox serving in the Polish army between World War I and World War II. You know, there were millions of Orthodox people in a much larger Poland than today that had millions of Orthodox, especially Ukrainian and Russian people. And so he, well, there are photographs of, of Father Basil Martiz uh, in his military uniform, like a colonel. He looks something like, he looks something like, actually like Nathan Bedford Forrest, the Civil War, the, the Confederate general from the from uh, Mississippi. He has got that kind of a beard. It's not a full beard. It's just kind of down the middle of his face with a little longer by the chin. It's dark gray, which makes him actually look Confederate rather than Yankee. <laughs> but, <laughs> but on his, uh, on his uh, lapel, there were three bark crosses. And there are photographs of him as this colonel in the Polish army as the main military chaplain for the Orthodox serving in the Polish army between the two world wars. <laughs> Then World War II began, they were wise enough probably not to budge. They let the German army run right over them and uh, survived World War II. In 1945, it was the Soviet army coming back. Not a happy time for that part of the world. His wife died that year. He was uh, a widower living with his daughter. And the new borders of Poland were being promulgated. You know, Poland basically moved further west. The eastern part of Poland was given to the Soviet Union, and uh, the eastern part of Germany was given to Poland to compensate. So Poland as a country basically shifted. Ethnic cleansing was required, however. And it was during that time, 1945, that the Polish parliament, uh, almost certainly under Soviet influence, passed the, uh, what's called uh, the Vistula, Act Vistula. Wiesela was the order expelling all the Orthodox people from the Carpathian Mountains from Poland and sending them to what